Last Monday, we started a look into the Bennington Triangle with the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. Well, as I mentioned last Monday, between 1945 and 1950, five people vanished out of thin air in this particular area of Vermont. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our producers and our patrons. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be looking into the disappearance of Mitty Rivers. Now, if you missed last Monday's episode over the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon, I will put a link to that video down in the description box below. Now, we started with the case of Paula Jean Weldon because her disappearance was the most famous. However, between the five years, between 1945 and 1950, one person went missing about a year before Paula Jean Weldon. Now, if you remember from last Monday, Paula Jean Weldon went missing in 1946. Well, Mitty Rivers went missing in November of 1945. Now, again, the Bennington Triangle is located in southwestern Vermont. And up to date, an estimated of 40 hikers and campers have vanished from this mountain. But again, we're just going to be focused on 1945 and 1950 because this is when the vanishings went into hyperdrive. And it was the English writer Joseph A. Citro who coined the name the Bennington Triangle in 1996, referring back to the disappearances that happened between 1945 in 1950. His book is called Passing Strange True Tales of New England Hauntings and Horrors. Now this Bennington Triangle is not just known for vanishings. It's also known for Bigfoot sightings, UFOs, portals, and apparently many people have claimed that when they're in the area of the Bennington Triangle, they also hear voices. Phenomenons around the Bennington Triangle are not anything new. Again, if you remember from last week, the Native Americans themselves refused to step foot in this area. In fact, the only time the Native Americans would actually come to this area was to bury their dead. The Native Americans believed that the four winds struggled within this area. And the struggle caused eternal friction. This makes sense, you know, with nature battling it out, the unforeseen forces of nature can, within that friction, create things like portals. We also see this with the plant life in the Glastonbury Mountain area, which is the area of the Bennington Triangle, where the plants tend to grow in very odd angles. Now, another interesting thing about this particular mountain that the natives believed was that on the very tip top of the mountain was a great boulder, a rock that if you stood on, you would be swallowed up. Basically, if you made it to the top of the mountain and decided to stand on top of the rock to view the world beneath you, the rock then would just swallow you whole. Now, in my research over these missing people's cases, I read about this rock quite a few times. And maybe after we get through all the missing people from 1945 to 1950, we can go back and try to look into this particular rock. If you remember from last week, I said that I believed that the dark players in our world know where particular portals are and they use these particular portals for their advantage. If you joined us on Aquarius Rising Africa last Monday, we talked about that with Weevilsburg Castle and the fact that the dark players that be in this, you know, movie 
know where all these doorways into the other side are. Now again, if you remember with the case of Paula Jean Weldon, I believed, it is of my opinion, that her family basically gave her up to these entities at this portal. But with some of these other people that have gone missing, I don't know if anybody actually gave them up or they just happened to fall through it on their own. Especially since with some of these missing people, especially with the case of Minnie Rivers that we're going to get to, there was no trace of them whatsoever after they vanished. In 1761, Benning Wentworth decided that he was going to draw the boundaries of a town within the Glastonbury Mountains. Now, the only problem was Benning Wentworth had never actually been to these mountains. His whole concept of having a town there was purely based on what he saw on the map. Needless to say, when the settlers got there to try to establish this town, they had a hard time doing so because of the terrain. The way the mountain grew, the sharpness, the angles, and again, the forces of nature that were definitely working against them meant that the town that Benning Wentworth drew ended up becoming two towns that could not actually connect together. These were the towns of Fayville and South Glastonbury. As we moved into the 19th century, logging and mining became the main enterprise in this area. But still, the loggers and the miners had a hard time contending with this particular mountain chain. Man versus nature, nature always wins. And if the settler had taken the advice of the Native Americans, maybe the catastrophes that would follow in this mountain wouldn't have happened. Around the end of the 19th century, these two little mining towns virtually became ghost towns because, again, nobody could stabilize their life in this particular Bennington Triangle. In 1894, they made a last attempt at reviving this town. They added hotels and casinos and had a railway that went right into the town, hoping that this beautiful mountain terrain would become a tourist hot spot for vacationers. But in 1897, a mere three years later, a flood destroyed the railroads into the town. By 1937, the town was officially unincorporated. Now, according to the 2010 census, there are still about eight people that have managed to live in this area. But again, this area is practically now a ghost town. Guess those Native Americans were right. There was something very strange and very dark about this particular mountain chain. Many rivers had grown up in this area. He knew this area like the back of his hand. And I know as somebody who lives at the very south end of the Appalachian Mountains, it's quite interesting to meet people who grew up in these mountainous environments. What appears to me to just be a forest where anybody could get lost, people who grow up in these areas tend to actually really understand the patterning of the trees and tend to have a vast connection to the nature around them. Many rivers ended up making a living as a hunting guide. So for people who were coming in from the big city who wanted a weekend getaway and to do some hunting, Many Rivers was their man. In November of 1945, four hunters came into the area once again looking for a guide to take them through the mountains. The 75-year-old Mitty Rivers, yes, you heard me right, he was 75 years old, volunteered to take these men out. All was going well until the group got to the area of the Long Trail. Now again, if you watched our video from last Monday, this is the same trail that Paula Jean Weldon also vanished on, the Long Trail. As the group of men were walking down the trail, all of a sudden, many rivers decided to take off in front of the four other men. Now, the four other men who were not from the area and obviously needed a guide to help them maneuver through the area and go hunting believed that many rivers had taken off maybe to look ahead to see if there was game or a place for them to set up camp. They didn't seem to be too concerned that this 75-year-old man had just decided to take off in front of them. 
They watched Mitty Rivers turn the corner, and as they eventually caught up to that corner and turned it themselves, they saw that Mitty Rivers had vanished. Now, at first, they weren't super concerned. They put all their gear down and just waited. They thought, oh, maybe he was just around another corner, or maybe he went to go check something out, and he'll be back. After all, this was a professional guide. He was the person who knew the land. They weren't concerned at all. But all of a sudden, minutes turned to hours, and many rivers had not returned. The four men, growing concerned, ended up making their way back to where they informed people that many rivers had vanished. Hours turned to days, days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months, and no one heard from many rivers again. Now, they did decide to do some searches, just like we do today when a person goes missing, or just like they would do a year later when Paula Jean Weldon herself would go missing. And no trace was found of many rivers. Well, I say no trace was found of many rivers. There was one item, just one, that they found that belonged to many rivers, and this was a cartridge found in a nearby stream that was believed to have belonged to Mitty Rivers. Now, the cartridge could mean anything. We know that Mitty was taking these four men out to hunt, and so maybe he had fired his gun at some point on the expedition. Now, in my opinion, yes, the guide might carry his own just in case for their own protection, but if you're taking people out and you're their guide, I would suspect that you would allow the four hunters to be the ones to do the hunting, where you would just step back and make sure everybody was okay. So did Mitty fire his after he had left the site of the four hunters? Was there something aggressively coming towards Mitty? and he was trying to defend himself. Many people believe that from 1945 to 1950, all the people who vanished, vanished under the work of a serial However, people like myself have some problems with this theory. We know with most serial they have particular types. They either go for girls, boys, whatever, different race, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. However, with all the people who disappeared from 1945 to 1950, they were all different ages, different genders, and from different socioeconomic backgrounds. There was no patterning to the type of person that vanished during this time period. Also, when we're dealing with a serial killer, a human that's doing this, most of the time, we will find a body. We will find remains of the crime. And as we'll go forward into the disappearances from 1945 to 1950, only one body was ever found. And that was not the body of Minnie Rivers or Paula Jean Weldon. Again, they literally vanished. Now, I did notice that somebody put in the comment section that there's an area near this town that's known for satanic practices. And I do tend to look deeper into this because my spidey senses, my gut is telling me that ding, 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 that's what's going on here. But of course, I don't have actual evidence to back that. This is just my gut hunch, knowing what we now know in this Great Awakening. But I would love to hear your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. And if you are from this area or if you've been to this area, let me know because I would like to hear your perception. What did you feel when you spent time in the Bennington Triangle? Just a little heads up. I after I got back from Gold Shores, I have hit the ground running. I am so honored to go on so many people's shows. I feel like we are just getting tighter and tighter and tighter as a group. That's including you guys watching as well because as you know, if you've been on this channel long enough, you know that I consider all of you a part of everyone who has a platform. Like where we go, one we go all, right? Like we're all in this together. And so that's super, super, super exciting. I was planning on releasing part one on our breakdown and our deep dive into Voodoo last Friday, but because there were some hiccups in some of the technology, some of our 
filming devices, trying to get that up. Of course, it's Mercury Retrograde. The part one on the breakdown of Voodoo will be airing this coming Friday. Congratulations again to the two women who won t-shirts with our drawing with Liz. I've got my Seven Into Eternity t-shirt on today. And as you heard Liz say, she wants to do more t-shirt drawings in the future. I also want to remind you guys to please go and subscribe to the Sacred Blue Tent Telegram channel that I am working with five other women. We're kind of managing that channel and bringing in special guests. We had phenomenal shows last week with Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa as well as on last Wednesday we did stuff with KB on Domestic ABUSE which was very 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 powerful. We will be on tonight again to go over Jekyll Island and the Federal Reserve. I believe that's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time but of course if I'm not correct in saying that, I will comment on the community page so that you can join us. Now with Telegram, if you're not able to join the live shows, there is a way to re-listen to the shows. We're recording all of them. And so you will have the opportunity to hear what you have missed. Now tomorrow, early tomorrow morning, I will be on with Charlie Ward. That will be 5 a.m. my time. Of course, his platform is not on this platform. So please go over to BitChute or Rumble or his own website. And then of course, from 1 to 3 p.m., I will be back on with David Zublik to read through the first part of the Yoga Sutras. And then, of course, we're going to get back into our discussion of Michael and Debbie Pearl. All right, you guys. I hope that you're having a wonderful start to a beautiful week. Hold the line. I feel very, very excited right now. I know a lot of people are stressed out. But to me, this is very, very exciting. We know that in the end, God wins. And so I want you, all you beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous people out there to walk around with that confidence, knowing that the light wins and you are of the light. And the best is yet to come. Thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music on this channel. If you would like to purchase the full song, there is a link down in the description box below. Thank you to Todd Roderick, as always, for helping me get this video out to you guys, and I will talk to you soon. Bye!